Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight podcast. Now I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One the consultancy that helps companies create value from data to accelerate growth. And our guest today is Jaime Sampera, CEO and co-founder of Satel IoT. Satel IoT is launching the first satellite constellation based on the 5G standard, allowing commercial unmodified cellular IoT devices to connect from space. In this talk, we discussed why 85% of the Earth remains unserved by terrestrial networks and how modern satellites can bring affordable connectivity to remote NB IoT devices. We also explored the factors influencing satellite connectivity cost structure, including satellite manufacturing, launch, radio technology, and service contract structure. If you find these conversations valuable, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. And if you'd like to share your company's story or recommend a speaker, you can email us at team at iot1.com. Finally, if you have an IoT research strategy or innovation initiative that you'd like to discuss, please email me directly at erik.walenza at iot1.com. Thank you. Jaume, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you a lot for inviting me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to this update. I was just mentioning that uh, we had your colleague Gianluca Rodolfi on a little bit more than a year ago, so that was episode one three three for for everyone who's listening. So, uh, if you haven't heard that podcast yet, uh, please do a, a a listen there first, and then today we will uh, be able to focus more on what's happened in the past year, and then what are you going to be uh, focused on in the future. But before we do that, um, I think you have a personally have a, a fascinating background, so would love to just uh, touch quickly on your background. And also when I'm talking to founders, it's always quite interesting to understand why you decided then to focus your energies on this particular problem in this particular company. I know you've founded something like 10 companies before. So can you just give us a, a little bit of a, a potted history and some of the highlights in your career? Yes, uh, I have been all my life. I studied uh, the communications engineer. And uh, after I did an MBA, and I love to start up companies, okay? That's my passion. This is not a work. It's, uh, it's just a, a full-time uh, a passion that takes me all the hours uh, of the week, okay? And uh, yes, I started with a video conferencing engineering company a long time ago, uh, dot-com companies, uh, some uh, telecom uh, operators all around the world in more than 28 countries, uh, satellite, uh, Wi-Fi, 5G, we buy the 5G license and that we put it. Uh, it has been a long run till, till arriving here. The, and this, with no doubt, it's the most promising uh, company I have started uh, since uh, today. Okay, It's a company that has a, a potential of, uh, of a scaling, up, a scaling up that I have not seen it uh, uh, before in any of the, my past companies. We started in 2018. If we think, okay, that in 15% of the world that is covered by the mobile operators, there are already 5 to 10 billion devices. And in the other 85% of the world, there are only 5 to 10 million devices. Okay, it, uh, something is wrong there. Okay, there is a potential of uh, connectivity in 85% of the world that is not happening. And this, so when, you, when you see these, uh, these numbers, okay, yeah. Uh, you discover that uh, there is a huge market to recover. And we demonstrate it, and uh, every day it gives us the reason that uh, there is a lot of people that want to connect uh, things in this 85% of the world, and today is not doing because of the cost uh, restrictions mainly, and the non-standard devices. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a fascinating statistic. I guess there's always this question of why now, right? And here there's probably two angles, right? So one is the maturation of IoT, right? Yes. And just the number of kind of new device categories that are coming on the market. The second is the maturation of the the, the satellite industry, which has gone a, a undergone really an interesting transition in the past few years. But what was it in 2018 that triggered you or that made you believe that this could be a successful business? Because we know how to move uh, things, okay? We are basically... We, when we started a, 
analyzing it, we saw that uh, a 5G IoT device or MB IoT device, the standard that is mostly used everywhere in the world, uh, around 200 countries, uh, all the countries of the world have uh, 170 uh, countries have MB IoT uh, deployments. When we look at the standard, what we saw is that the device, the hardware part of the device, was able to connect directly to a satellite, to a lower satellite, but the software needs to be modified. Then when you explain that to some of the traditional space companies or satellite companies uh, that we're going to modify the standard in order that the same devices may connect uh, in a seamless way to a base station or to a satellite, they just did this uh, a smaller smile that uh, we all know, okay, oh yeah, Jaume, you are going to modify the standard. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's amazing. Good luck. Okay, and and we did it. Okay, for the last uh, four years, we have been contributing to the 3GPP, which is the global organization that set up the standard for the mobile industry. We have been the number one contributor to the new release of the standard. There has been no space company with more contributions that we have had in these last years. In order that the standard move, of course, we have done it because it makes sense because we got all the back of the large chipset companies because everything uh, has to be uh, moving in this uh, in a direction. But it was not easy, it was not uh, evident, and, and this is something that uh, we believe in, and the need is it's there. And since then, it has been a continuous acceleration of the project from day to day, okay? We launched our first satellite 2021, as you know. We launched the second one this year. We, in a few weeks, we are going to test with uh, Phonica uh, the end-to-end technology uh, for first time in history, okay, the, the same device connected to both means. And uh, before the end of the year, we're going to have the first commercial constellation in the world that works with fully standard devices with nothing in between, okay? When people ask me, oh, yes, but you need a different antenna, you need to modify the device. No, there is no modification. The same device that today connects to a base station, when it will run out of coverage, it will connect to our satellites. And here we have uh, some patterns that makes our uh, uh, proposal quite unique because we have a 5G core that allows us to do uh, roaming with the mobile operators. In the world of the roaming partners, uh, there is uh, an institution that is called GCMA. We are uh, the first satellite company that uh, is a full member of the GCMA. What does this mean? This means that we are influencing on the, on the new roaming contracts that will be signing with the mobile operators. We are writing it. And at the same time, we we are the only one that we are able to sign. We are the only satellite company in the world that uh, may sign roaming agreements with the mobile operators, a standard roaming agreement. Of course, you may sign whatever you want with a, uh, between two companies, okay? You, are, you don't need to, to belong to any organization. But mobile operators, they are super structured guys, okay, that uh, don't want to have a new contract every day, okay, they love a standardization, and when we sit down with the mobile operators, we put on the table exactly the same contract they have already signed a hundred times before, and this is, again, uh, this is scalability, okay, this is the way to easy the thing for, for all the different players and make it happen in a very short time. Hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, let's clarify the value proposition quickly. So if I understand somebody has an IoT device, could be a pacemaker, construction equipment, a, a sensor on a crate, and that device is going to be connected to um, a mobile connection if it's within network. And if it moves outside of network, then if you have this agreement in, in uh, place with the, the, the provider, it would switch over to satellite connectivity via NB IoT. Is that roughly the proposition? Yes, yes, in a similar way. The final customer, uh, it will be impossible to distinguish if they are roaming to another mobile operator when they are traveling abroad uh, to, to another country, okay, or they are, uh, or they are, they are roaming to our satellites. It will be absolutely seamless. And for the moment, I'm sure that in uh, a couple of years, there will be millions of devices that will be connected to our satellite, and the final user will have no idea if it's connected to a base station or to a satellite. And I guess one thing that has always slowed down satellite connectivity in the past is simply the cost. And so I guess if we're looking at MBIOT, then certainly that's a, a much different cost structure than a mobile phone, for example. But what does that cost trend look like of connecting a, an IoT device? I mean, where are we today? And then maybe in five years, where do you expect us to be in terms of the, the cost for that connectivity? That's a super interesting question because when you say... Uh, a seamless roaming, 
it includes cost. Because if the cost is super high, then it's not simpler because you're not going to use it unless you are in a, an emergency uh, situation. Then, uh, and this is part of our uh, proposal. What, uh, when we say seamless connectivity, it means that the, the costs have to be uh, very close to what you are paying for a terrestrial uh, connection. Why now the contracts that we are signing have an RP of 2.5 euros device months? This is uh, quite similar of the, connecting, uh, of the connection cost uh, while you are in terrestrial, uh, uh, in terrestrial coverage. And this will be decreasing in time, okay? We expect in two, three years to be around one euro a month per device, uh, which is something that it's uh, fully affordable for any, uh, for most of the applications. I don't know if a hundred percent. We are already signing with uh, some people that we have signed uh, with, uh, with a company more than half a million devices or half a million lines, okay? Uh, of course, the cost decreased with the number of lines, and in this case, we are under the one dollar a month per device. We we have we have built it all all our infrastructure. We are we are working with nano satellites. Nano satellites in low Earth conservation means a a, a super cost effective approach, and this is important because uh, the, everything is designed. Uh, we design from a scratch in order to be the partner for massive IoT connectivity. We don't want to be the one, okay, that connects its critical IoT applications, but the, the one that connects uh, millions of uh, containers, cows, uh, um, electricity uh, poles, or, or whatever, okay, or water uh, 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 water counters. Okay, the, all these is, is the kind of things that uh, we have designed for. And to do that, uh, the costs have to be seamless, have to be uh, uh, something that uh, you may forget about it because. Uh, the gain that you get in connecting these things, okay, is much, much higher than the cost of the connection itself. Got you. Okay, great. So cost is one big factor here. Uh, I guess the other would be performance. And again, if you're tracking a cow or a container, having a, you know, maybe a one minute delay in sending a packet, if information is not going to be as critical as if you are, um, if you're streaming a video and you expect kind of real time connectivity, but nonetheless, there's, you know, there's probably some, some aspects that are important there. How does performance compare today via satellite versus uh, terrestrial? Today, the, the, the latency, the, what, um, now, let me explain something before, okay? We got a, a, a unique system that allows us to do roaming with a store and forward. What does this mean? This means that uh, uh, when you do roaming, you need uh, real-time connectivity between your device and the main core, which, uh, uh, which obliges you to deploy a full satellite constellation, 250 satellites with, uh, with inter-satellite ring in order that your device, it connects to, to the satellites that connects with the uh, mobile core in order to authenticate uh, your device. We have developed a unique uh, procedure that it, it allows us to do a store and forward of the keys. This means, okay, that with the four satellites that we are launching this year, we may connect uh, devices with a uh, roaming procedure of course, with four satellites, as you know, when you are in a low Earth orbit, the satellites go around the, uh, the globe while the globe is spinning. And this means, okay, that you have uh, around, in average, four connections per day. This is perfect for the cows, uh, for agriculture, for some of the infrastructures. This is far away from being uh, useful for the certain applications. But with our growth strategy, we are going to keep launching more and more satellites, decreasing the time between one satellite and the next, in order to go to near real time by 2025. What we have seen in the IoT market is that more or less there is one third of the market that needs few messages per day, one third of the market that needs around one message per hour, and then is one third of the market that goes from one message per hour to real time. Then uh, uh, our uh, unique technology allows us to keep capturing more and more part of the market while we launch uh, more and more satellites in our constellation. Mm, yeah, makes sense. In any case, I, I guess the 85% of the world that you'd be addressing with satellites is the place where these devices that don't require real-time connectivity tend to be located, right? Because ah, they tend to be remote assets. That's right. Um, and so the, you launched a satellite, I believe it was on April 4th, and this was your second satellite. You named it the, the Groundbreaker, and it was the, the first 5G standard uh, satellite. So tell me a little bit about the satellite technology. I mean, what was different between this satellite and your first satellite? 
And then what are the critical factors uh, as you're continuing to innovate the satellite technology? Yes, the, the first satellite was a fully test satellite. It's a, ten, a satellite that allows us to do all the contributions to the standard. For example, when you have this continuous coverage, like we have, and which is uh, normal in Rio, um, the device cannot wake up whenever they want. Okay, the, the device has to wake up when the satellite is over the is flying over the head. Okay, of the of the device. Uh, uh, then uh, what this means? Okay, that the device needs to have the ephemerides of the satellite in order to know when the satellite is flying over. Uh, because one of the key points of the MBIOT, of all the IoT technologies that are spread away, it's battery life. Mm. Okay? Then uh, we might not allow the, the device waking up, sending the message and nothing uh, happening and trying again and trying again and trying again until the satellite flies. This is one of the contributions that we did to the standard, that it's already part of the standard, and it was thanks to the, this first satellite uh, that we launched uh, in 2021. The second satellite is a satellite that uh, already have uh, uh, the version one of our radio. We have developed our own radio because uh, there was no uh, no radio available with the characteristics that uh, we needed. The fourth satellite that we are launching is uh, already the generation two of the radio. This radio is a radio that allows to connect directly with uh, the devices. At the same time, okay, we are testing all the different elements of the satellite in order to, uh, uh, to be a success when we launch these uh, four satellites. The devices that we are going to connect, they are standard devices, but need to have on board the, the release 17. It's a software update. Okay? Today, the uh, release 17 for the Leo, for the World Orbit, is not still available. It will be available for the second half of the year, according to the main uh, chips manufacturers. This means, okay, that the test that we are doing today, okay, with this first satellite, uh, is not with uh, uh, fully consumer products because uh, they are still there, okay. With the first satellite, we are going to be connecting directly fully standard devices, the same that you may buy for five dollars in the website of you of your mobile operator. Okay, okay, great. So you're you're building yeah new technology into the satellites based on the standards that you established through this this prior work. Um, if you if you you said yeah, I think you're going to launch another three satellites this year, and then it sounds like by 2025 you'll have a, a significant constellation in order to provide near real time connectivity. So, in addition to increasing the volume of satellites that you have in um, near Earth orbit, how do you anticipate the uh, the technology of these satellites changing? Are there I mean, wh- what are the key aside from the kind of the satellite uh, the the standards? What are the key success factors or let's say maybe differentiation factors that you're you're focused on your engineering team is focused on of course the, the we have the the radio it's, it's super important because it's a radio that it's uh, multi-carrier multi-beam that it uh, may work with different bands and this is super useful because when you fight over the different countries uh, uh you're not going to have the same band the satellite operators are used to have large geo satellites that are uh, uniband that work just in the band that they have uh, they have been uh, addressed to, okay? Uh, they have been authorized. Uh, in our case, we, when we fight over Mexico, we, we may have to use uh, a different frequency that we may fight over US, okay? And uh, our satellites have the capability of changing from one country to the other in order to have the best uh, use, okay, the, of the capacity of flying over the different uh, parts of the world. This is important because it gives us a lot of flexibility in uh, when we address the different counties uh, and regulators, uh, which is an entry barrier that is there. Okay, it's it's a matter of time and money. But uh, when you sit down with the regulator and you say we need only this, uh, uh, a small part of the spectrum, uh, in order that you mobile operators have full coverage everywhere for the final users, this open up. Uh, a lot of those and, and help out a lot in uh, when we when we are deploying our services uh, in different uh, countries. Apart from the radio, okay, it's important uh, the 5G core that we have in the ground. Uh, this 5G core it's uh, it's, uh, it's divided in two. One part is in the ground, and the part is in the satellite, and which is uh, the one that allows us to do this turn and forward. Uh, Consider that it's uh, unique in the world of the satellite uh, uh, roaming capabilities. The satellite itself, we are building it with the standard uh, subsystems, 
we don't want to put our uh, focus on, on developing the best uh, power system or the best solar panels. There are people out there okay, that have uh, very nice technology and that uh, allow us to uh, do it faster and a more, much more driven way. Hmm. Yeah, this regulatory point. I mean, having a deeply regulated industry is not necessarily a bad thing for business, right? It, as you mentioned, it, it means that uh, there's a certain cost to entering, but then once you successfully enter, um, you also have some kind of uh, some kind of barrier to the market. I saw that you've applied to FCC to connect MB IoT devices in the U.S. directly from space. What is that application? I mean, is that a is that a two year negotiation or is it a fairly fairly straightforward process? And, and then do you have to replicate that across you know 180 countries, or is it once you get FCC acceptance, then going to Mexico or going to to Panama is relatively simple? There are very few countries in the world as. Uh complex as United States, United States, uh, and uh, there is a reason, United States is uh, one of the uh, uh, the biggest markets in the world and, and it needs to be regulated. Uh, there are very uh, good things that FCC has already included in any uh, uh, anyone okay, that wants to operate over the country, for example, the needs to deorbit the satellites. This was not compulsory. The ITU is not uh, already obliging you uh, to the orbit, the satellites one they are out of uh, life, uh, which means okay that uh, uh, today there are a lot of uh, satellites that uh, dead satellites they are already not performing anything okay and they are still there okay and if you don't have uh, a proportion in order to the orbit the satellites they may be in a space from twenty additional years uh, all these debris that we need to clean it up because uh, if you want that. Uh, the space sector develops uh, uh, that we want. Okay, we need all this data from uh, from our old satellites that are not doing anything. Okay, then this is an FCC uh, an FCC norm. Okay, that uh, obliges to do it. Okay, but apart from that, the, the others. Uh, then with FCC, we present uh, what is called a streamline a streamline uh, permission. Okay, that uh, uh, will allow us to launch the first ten satellites. We are going to present a commercial one that we are going to go up to the 500 satellites that we have been authorized by the ITU. As you know, the ITU is the International Telecommunications Union that regulates the space. Then we got the first permission from the ITU. Then you have to go. In some countries, it's quite easy. In some countries, it's more complicated. Every country is uh, different. And uh, in the United States, uh, we present this, uh, uh, this permission, okay, this... Uh, this request in order to start operating uh, next year. Okay, okay, fantastic. Um, and so when I talked to Gianluca, um, you had just recently launched the first satellite, and I think commercially we're just getting traction. Um, it's been a year since. What I saw on your website now is you have something like um, 50 MNO, MVNO customers, and I guess through them, some multiple of that of end users or companies that are then uh, using your network. What have you seen so far in terms of adoption, in terms of which product categories, which industries, um, anything there surprising in terms of what you expected to see from the market, what you've actually seen in terms of adoption? Oh, yes. Uh, what we have seen is that, uh, apart from the, uh, as you were saying, okay, we are an extension of coverage of the MNOs, then our channel would be the MNOs and then VNOs all around the world. We have already signed with 50, which give us a, uh, well, more than 50 currently, okay, that uh, give us uh, full coverage and global footprint everywhere in the world. Almost everywhere in the world, there are, uh, I think, uh, uh, around 10 countries, okay, that uh, we cannot already, we, we don't have already any any partner there, okay. But uh, but apart from that, what we have been doing for the last year, for the last half year, okay, is we have been signing with final users and valid reservers. What we have been saying is binding orders. We wanted uh, to uh, to start signing these binding orders that we once we start the commercial service, we're going to take it and to give it to the MNOs and VNOs in order that they provide the final service with the final user. And just in this uh, last six months, uh, we have signed uh, with uh, these uh, final customers and uh, our receivers contracts everywhere in the world. And we are already at more than 80 million euros of ARR signed almost one year before the service start. And this means uh, two things. First, it's that 
what we are doing is that what the market expects, that our product is the one that fits on the market. And the second one is that the, and the, there is a huge market out there, okay? Because it's impossible to sign 80 million euros of, uh, of sales one year before starting your commercial service if the market is not, uh, it has not a, a huge appetite uh, for the product, which is amazing. And it's exactly, it's what we're expecting, okay? That's why we are here. But at the same time, uh, you never know. The engineers, okay, sometimes we, we invent things that uh, nobody wants, okay? We, we see it uh, as a wonderful uh, technological and amazing uh, technology, okay? But but after, okay, we go into the market and the, the people say, why uh, do I want this? In this case, uh, it has not happened, okay? In this case, what we have discovered, and this amazing technology that uh, that we are uh, putting on our satellites and, uh, and we are going to go commercial, beginning next year, okay, it's exactly what the market needs. And the uh, demonstration of that is uh, all these uh, orders, binding orders that uh, we are signing with the final customers. Okay, well, congratulations to you and the team. I'm sure the engineers are all breathing a little bit more uh, yeah, smoothly now. That's a kind of a tense thing to spend four years on um, technology development. And then you see, okay, will the market accept it or not? When you look at those orders, what are the big use cases? Are we talking about logistics and uh, marine? Are we talking about agriculture, mining? What, what are the big use case areas? Here there is, uh, you have to think, okay, that what we are signing today is the uh, orders that we are going to be able to sell with these four satellites. This means that uh, we are only signing with customers that are non-time sensitive. Uh, once say that, okay, that, for sure, logistics will be the number one market, but it's not already there because our service is not already there. Logistics uh, uh, needs from uh, one message every two hours to one message every hour. Okay, and we uh, we are going to be there next year um, with a new satellite that we are launching, but not beginning 2024. Then why now? What we are saying is a lot of agriculture, a lot of cattle management. A lot of infrastructures, which is, is amazing, okay, because they are very interesting companies that uh, does amazing things in order to reduce the cost of uh, maintenance of uh, overdukes, acidukes, uh, high power lines. A lot of forestry. We are signing. Uh, we were signing a lot of projects uh, for forestry uses. Some maritime. Okay, these are the main sectors that today are using. Once uh, next year we go under the. Uh, one hour uh, revisit time or one hour latency, then logistics will exploit because we are already having a lot of interest from the logistic companies in order to have this service ready as soon as possible. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So what else in the industry? So, I, I mean, this is an industry, I think, where there's a lot of different uh, change factors, both uh, in the on the connectivity side, but also in the satellite side. I, I had a uh, a podcast with a company, I'm, I'm forgetting the name here, but they support with cleanup of uh, satellites at end of life, right? So because obviously <laughs> this territory is going to start becoming crowded relatively soon, right? You're going to go from two satellites to 500, you know, at some point in the future, right? And so uh, there's going to be a lot of new new challenges to face there. When you look at the industry landscape, aside from the NVNOs, who are you working with? Um, on the sales side, on the satellite operations side, how is this landscape evolving today? There are a, a very, the new space uh, sector is it's exploding, and uh, new companies appear every day or every week. And uh, we are working with uh, uh, kind of a ground station as a service, which is super useful because it doesn't make any sense to have your own ground stations, unless in our case, with a couple of companies there, uh, KSAT and River Space. We are working with all these uh, subsisted manufacturers in, in Spain, for example. We have an, uh, one of the leaders in uh, solar panels, EHF. One of the areas, okay, that I think that we have to both uh, we'll see a huge change is in the launching capacity. Uh, today, we are launching with the SpaceX in both cases, uh, in the last satellite and the fourth satellite that we are launching before the end of the year. Okay, here, uh, although Vision Orbit, okay, which was the, it, it seemed to be, okay, the, the most uh, close uh, to, to commercial proposition. It's, it's not uh, anymore there, okay. I think that we will see a lot of uh, small launchers coming to the market in order to offer different possibilities. And this is 
Yeah, competition is always good for the final uh, user, for the consumer. And uh, in our case, for sure, it would be good because uh, now we are going to have more capacity, more opportunities to launch in a more frequent uh, times. And this is important in order to uh, dynamize uh, on the space industry. Mm. Yeah, I guess if you look at the cost structure, I mean, SpaceX has already brought down the cost of delivery quite a bit, oh, right? But Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. No, no. Yeah. That, that, what the SpaceX has done for the space, without a SpaceX, the space industry, it was not going to be the same. Okay? Uh, the, a SpaceX has... Uh, uh, I think that Elon Musk has an incredible capacity of disrupting industries. Now, what they have done for the electric car, that now all the car construction companies uh, are following, okay, is... Uh, they have attacked it on. Uh, they, he's already doing exactly the same with the launch industry. He's just start, and uh, uh, they all have to follow. Okay, if they want to to be completely out of the market, and this is something that that change industries and uh, change the world. Well, yeah, and it's re- remarkable. I mean, it's only been what a decade or so, and the price has fallen by I don't know what is it five x uh, or one tenth. One tenth, yeah, right. Um, and if we look forward 10 years into the future, right, that they'll continue to increase their capacity with larger vehicles. But also, like you said, there'll be smaller players who are providing services for smaller satellites. And, um, yeah, we'll have a continued decrease. So um, so we have that as a big driver in terms of you know improving the margins. And I guess on the satellite side, what is the cost structure? I mean, I, I know you have kind of a, you know, more micro satellites today, but what is the cost structure, let's say the cost trend for the actual satellite hardware look like? What is still missing is uh, the satellite uh, construction companies, okay, mm-hmm. that have the same industrial capacities as uh, in the avionic uh, uh, world, okay? Today, uh, they, most of the satellites are still artisanal, okay? They, they are built one by one, uh, and each one is different from the last one, okay? Then we need production lines of, of satellites if we want to be... Uh, exactly the where we want to be, okay, in the next uh, five years. This is something that is going to happen because uh, the subsystem industry is evolving uh, super fast, but, but we need more companies like uh, Starling or by uh, or like uh, Satellite IoT will be in the in the short term in order that to, to put on the table a large number of satellites, uh, construction contracts for this. Uh, and we, we are visiting different potential providers in order to, to find the one who has got the, uh, the vision and the ambition to be the, the one that is, uh, is going to build up our, our conservation. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting point. So the industry is shifting from a project based many, you know, and then hopefully to an assembly line manufacturing. Oh, uh, uh, this one which is the challenges. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who actually, who actually acts there, right? Who, who actually takes that opportunity, right? Yeah, great. Um, any anything else that we haven't touched on that you'd like to share as an update? No, I think that uh, the only point that I think that it's very important in our industry is, is this uh, super high topic, okay, that is direct to the phone. But what's going to happen here? And uh, and I wanted to share my vision uh, with you on this. There are some companies that, that they are trying to, uh, to put broadband, 5G broadband everywhere in the world. It's amazing. And the technology they are using... It's an amazing technology, but the problem is the market. When you launch a, a satellite conservation, one of the problems you have is the satellites in in uh, geostationary satellites, uh, you beam may light some specific countries where you know that there is uh, business there. When you do a real conservation, the satellites go around the world, okay, and, uh, and you cover everything. And everything means all the oceans, all the countries that have people that may pay for and the countries that the people that may not pay for, okay, or they are quite empty. Then this is a commercially the challenge there. It's uh, not only technology, but a um, commercial challenge in order to put in the market something that it's uh, feasible, okay, and uh, it's commercial sustainable. Our proposal there is uh, in a couple of years we'll be able to connect uh, direct to the phone with messaging. Mm. We believe that this is the right proposal, okay, because messaging is. Uh, what we really need. Low-cost messaging everywhere in the world is a huge market. It's something that uh, the people want, and it's something that does not need the investments uh, that you need for voice or uh, broadband direct to the phone. We are going. Uh, we are designing already this with some of the largest chips manufacturers in the world. 
And this uh, is something that we believe that it will be also uh, absolutely disrupting uh, mm. for the industry. Okay, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, a lot of developing countries are doing financial services, right? Payments through messaging and so forth, right? And that would be a game changer for a farmer, you know, in a remote village to be able to have access to uh, affordable satellites. Yeah, well, fa- fantastic. Um, really appreciate you giving this update, and I'm really uh, happy to see the progress that you've made. Maybe we can have another call in a year, and I, I think that the industry is moving so quickly, right? There's always something around the corner. It will be a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at IoT1.com.